Good afternoon, folks. Welcome back to the Food for the Faithful channel with me, Bill Reimer, your somewhat reluctant prophet. Today, today's episode is mostly dedicated to Bible believers, although I encourage those of you who may be interested in what the Bible actually teaches, stay tuned and find out a little bit about the grand narrative that defines Christianity and the West. Mankind is embedded in the story we tell ourselves as to our origins, the nature of the world, and our proper place in it. Humanity is embedded in a story. More than anything else, these stories have been the primary and most essential tool we have used to define ourselves as a species. The greatest civilizations which have ever existed were the ones who had created the grandest narratives to define themselves. Long before man invented written language, there were those whose sacred duty it was to memorize and tell these stories to their people. When examining what we hold to be true, one must always consider the narrative's success in creating stable civilizations. Therefore, it is important that we examine in detail the grand narrative which has created Western civilization. The reason for this ought to be obvious. Today we are being faced with another narrative which has no power of creation. Rather, its sole function is to tear down the grand narrative which once defined Western civilization for over a millennium and a half. No sooner do I think that I have reached peak cynicism than the Marxo-fascist clowns fomenting cultural genocide outdo themselves by inventing some new form of reality rejecting insanity guised as moral virtue. Therefore, Christianity, along with Greek philosophy, has formed the basis of the grand narrative that has defined the West for over 1,500 years. And even it had elements within it which were deconstructive rather than biblical. The matter of apostolic succession is one such example. There were many believers who had remained outside the fold of the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches who held the same beliefs that their ancestors had received from the apostles. They, in turn, inspired the pre-reformers, such as the Lollards and Waldensians, who then inspired the Protestant reformers. These faithful believers remain as examples of those whose practices and doctrines most closely align with the Holy Scriptures. Today, you can still draw a line through Europe, between the countries where the Reformation took hold and between those who had remained Orthodox or Roman Catholic. The economic differences remain today, even though the original religious zeal is gone. And in the absence of that zeal, moral corruption based upon resentment and a cult of victimhood has infected the West under the guise of cultural Marxist critical theory. Next subtitle, How the Faithful Regarded the Office of the Pope. The Reformers had inherited the belief from the pre-Reformers that the Antichrist would be someone who would come to, to, who would claim to have the power to absolve sin while holding the keys to heaven, earth, and hell. The three-tiered headdress of the Pope, also known as the Papal Tiara, or Triregnum, symbolizes the triple power of the Pope. These powers are traditionally expressed during a Pope's coronation as follows. One, Father of Kings. This signifies the Pope's authority over secular rulers. Two, Governor of the World. This represents the Pope's temporal power over the world. Three, Vicar of Christ. This donates the Pope's spiritual authority as a representative of Christ on the earth. Which is why the term Antichrist doesn't mean against Christ. It means in the place of Christ. The keys to heaven, earth, 
Heaven and earth are symbolized by two cross keys that often appear, appear with the papal tiara in the insignia of the Vatican City and the Holy See. These keys signify the authority traditionally believed to be given by Christ to Peter as the first bishop of Rome. All the uh, research, the sources for research below that section. Next subtitle, Apostolic Succession Among the Believers Who Through was through Paul and Barnabas and their converts rather than through Peter. There is no historical record of Peter ever going to Rome. It was Paul who was martyred in Rome since he went there to be tried as a Roman citizen. Paul himself asserted that he was sent as an apostle to the Gentiles. After his conversion, Paul believed that Jesus Christ had commissioned him to spread the teachings of Christianity beyond the Jewish community. This is evidenced by the epistles he wrote, as well as the Acts, as in the Acts of the Apostles. As for Peter, he is often referred to as the Apostle to the Jews. Paul himself stated that Peter had the special charge of being an Apostle to the Jews, just as he, Paul, was an Apostle to the Gentiles. A little sip of tea. However, it is important to note that Peter also played a significant role in the early Christian church and was instrumental in spreading teachings of Jesus Christ, both the Jews and Gentiles. Barnabas, like Paul, also played a crucial role in spreading the teachings of Christianity to the Gentiles. He was a close companion of Paul and accompanied him on many of his missionary journeys. All the sources for that section linked below it so you can verify these things for yourself. I never ask anyone to believe me. Believe the scriptures Believe the information I've provided. So what did Luther believe regarding the Antichrist? In fact, Martin Luther did come to believe that Pope Leo X was the Antichrist. This belief emerged around 1520, after Luther's views on the papacy shifted dramatically. He was particularly critical of the Pope's authority and the sale of indulgences, which he saw as a corruption within the church. Luther's treatise, titled Against the Execrable Bull of Antichrist, explicitly called Leo the Antichrist and argued that the papal bull aimed to compel people to deny God. This was a significant part of the broader critique of the Catholic Church, which led to the Protestant Reformation. Luther's stance was that anyone who blocked people from Christ or worked against the teachings of the Scripture could be considered an antichrist, a term he applied to Pope Leo X. All the sources for that research underneath that section. Next subtitle, How the Jesuit Order Carried Out the Counter-Reformation While Murdering Faithful Believers with Impunity. Who was the Catholic preacher and counter priest and counter-reformer who wrote the theory that the Antichrist would be a future political ruler. His name is Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, who was a significant figure during the Counter-Reformation and contributed to the intellectual defense of the Catholic Church against Protestant accusations. Bellarmine's writings on the Antichrist posited that this figure would be a political leader who would oppose the Church seek to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, and demand to be worshipped as a god. This interpretation aligns with traditional Catholic teaching and the views of the Church Fathers on the Antichrist. Cardinal Robert Bellamine was a Jesuit who had entered the Society of Jesus, commonly known as the Jesuits, in 1560, and was a significant figure within the order. He is well remembered for his contributions to Catholic theology and his role in the Counter-Reformation. Bellarmine was also canonized as a saint and named a doctor of the church, which is an honor given to saints who have made significant contributions to theology or doctrine through their research, study, or writing. 
all the sources of research under that section. How the false doctrine of pre-tribulation rapture theory entered the modern evangelical church is the next subtitle. John Nelson Darby is credited with developing the pre-tribulation rapture theory, which he extensively taught and popularized. This theory suggests that Christ will remove the church from the world before the period of tribulation. Darby, an influential figure among the original Plymouth Brethren, is considered the father, father of modern dispensationalism and futurism. His teachings had a significant impact on the Bible church and evangelical Christianity, particularly through the spread of dispensationalism and his Bible translations. Darby's ideas were further popularized in the United States in the early 20th century, century, notably by the Schofield Reference Bible. All the sources of reference for that underneath that section. Next subtitle. What parts of Darby's doctrine had originated from Cardinal Bellarmine's counter-reformation propaganda? John Nelson Darby's development of dispensationalism was influenced by a variety of sources, including earlier works by Jesuit theologians, such as Francisco Ribera and Cardinal Robert Bellarmine. While Darby is recognized as the father of dispensationalism, his ideas were not entirely original, but rather built upon earlier theological concepts. The writings of Ribera and Bellarmine contain ideas that the laid the groundwork for the future development of dispensationalism. These works were initially intended to counter the Protestant Reformation's interpretation of the Book of Revelation, which identified the Pope as the Antichrist and the Catholic Church as the Whore of Babylon. It is important to note that while Darby may have been influenced by the works of these Jesuit theologians, his own doctrines were distinct and developed within the context of his time and religious environment. Darby's dispensationalism emphasized what he falsely thought was a literal interpretation of the Bible and the separation of God's plans for Israel and the church, which became a cornerstone of his theological framework. All the references underneath that section. So, in conclusion, so I have a question to those of you who consider themselves to be Bible-believing Christians. How are we to fight cultural Marxist critical theory and its concerted attack on our faith if we have swallowed the lies of the enemy to believe in false doctrines which were not received in apostolic succession from the founders of the Western Gentile Church? Persecution is coming for the church, so you must prepare yourselves. The word rapture does not appear in the Bible because it's not scriptural. Christ will return, and may we prepare ourselves while equipping his body for his return. This is the only way we can stave off the ruin of, the, of godless critical theory, which has now even infected the weak churches who themselves have become woke. The phrase, be instant, in season and out of season, is a biblical reference from 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. In the King James Version of the Bible, the verse reads, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. This verse is, is part of a charge that the Apostle Paul gives to Timothy, his disciples. The phrase, be instant, in season, out of season, is often interpreted to mean that one should be ready to proclaim the word of God at all times, whether it's convenient or not. Different translations of the Bible may use different wording, but the general message remains the same, to be prepared to preach the word of God at all times and to correct, rebuke, and encourage with patience and sound teaching. All the references for that section underneath. Remember, Jesus was betrayed and was led to the cross 
was betrayed to the Romans and led to the cross because the religious people of his day demanded his death. I detest high church mummery. I have a funny story. I had a great uncle who had a Catholic neighbor. They didn't have fish one Friday, but they had a ham in the larder. So he told the priest that he didn't have fish and only had a ham. And so the priest came over and told him if he dunked the ham in the well, he'd bless it and it'd come out fish. And he told my great uncle this story, to which he replied, You darn fool! Twas ham when it went into the well, and it twas ham when it came out. That's all I have to say today. That pretty well sums it up. Ham or fish? The truth or a lie written by men dressed in flowing linen with waving smoking handbags.